Yeah. yeah. I got it. Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming out. And um, for those online, thank you for joining. My name is Zach Parrish. I'm the programming librarian here at the Bexley Public Library. Um, a quick note uh, on how today's program will work, because it is a hybrid program. Um, for those in the room, if you have a question at the end, just raise your hand, I'll bring the mic over. That way those online can hear uh, what was asked. And for those online, feel free to type your questions into the chat at any time and we will get those asked at the end. Um, before we jump into tonight's program, I do want to uh, highlight a couple library related things. Um, if you haven't heard yet, 2024 is the library's centennial, so we are celebrating our 100th birthday. Um, if you haven't gotten the centennial guide, we do have them available in the back there. We have lots of wonderful programming plans, so please uh, take a look at it. And we also have our spring program guide uh, that has all of our spring uh, programs for March, April, and May, so we have lots of fun stuff lined up at the library, um, so please grab one of those as well. Uh, just to highlight a couple things that we have coming up, next Tuesday, March 19th at 7 o'clock, we have trivia at the Drexel, so uh, you can join us at the Drexel theater for some fun trivia. Um, next week's theme is the Roaring Twenties and fitting with our 100th uh, birthday celebration. And then Wednesday, March 27th at uh, 7 o'clock, our technology librarian Josh Bryant will be um, leading a chat GPT basics program. And the day after, Thursday, March 28th at 6.30, um, we have the third iteration of the next chapter series um, with Michael Wilkos from the United Way of Central Ohio, who will be moderating a panel on the future of transportation um, around Central Ohio. Um, so for tonight's program, we are very lucky to be joined um, by uh, Lisa Goldsand and Raghul Santil. Um, Lisa Goldsand is the founder of Circular Thrift LLC, which champions sustainable consumption. Her startup, focused first in Bexley, Ohio, offers consumers a variety of convenient ways to scale the reuse of clothing. Solutions include publicly accessible clothing drop-ins. One is conveniently uh, located in the library's lobby. Um, community clothing swaps, pop-up thrift shops, and upcycle projects. Lisa's goal is to raise awareness about consumption and to shift consumer behavior toward reuse instead of new purchases. Lisa lives right here in Bexley, where she serves as the chair of the city's Environmental and Sustainable uh, Action Committee. <clears throat> Raghul Santil is currently earning his master's degree at The Ohio State University in the field of human sciences. He has an extensive background in both academia and the textile industry and specializes in sustainable and circular design and fashion and home textiles. His skill set includes developing high quality te technical textiles for top tier clients with a deep understanding of raw materials, embellishment techniques and quality assistance. Raghul is dedicated to transforming the home textiles and apparel, and apparel sector by leveraging insights in consumer behavior, post-consumer waste, retail and supply chain management, and environmental sustainability. He is committed to collaborating with others for a more sustainable and responsible industry. So I will turn it over to Lisa and Raghul. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Okay, before we get started, I just wanna thank you, Raghul, for being here with me this Thank evening. You. I'm excited. We're excited to share with all of you some of the work we've done together. I do also just have to say I adore Raghul, and we've been together in um, Fort Collins, Colorado, when I presented the hypothesis of this project early in 2023. I forced him to have dinner with three generations of my family in Colorado. <laughs> he was very gracious. Mom, if you're watching, here he is. Here's Raghul. And uh, we also did a road trip in uh, November to Baltimore to present the data that we're about to share with you at the International Textile and Apparel Association Conference. And I was too cheap to fly, so Raquel and I have had, what, 12 hours of uninterrupted conversation all in the past couple of months. So thank you for being here, and I appreciate you immensely. Yeah. Okay, so I am gonna ramble on in a few minutes about the projects. And then you're gonna talk about the findings at the end and what you did to analyze it. But can you maybe take a few minutes and sure. tell everybody why this is important? Is there a problem with sustainable fashion? Is there a problem with clothing consumption? Tell us what you know. Yeah, so anyone just have an idea of how much US particularly generate the textile waste? A lot. 
So annually, US generates 18 million tons textile waste, and only like every person, average US citizens wear a clothing just for seven to 10 times. After that, it is thrown, just thrown, or it is going to Goodwill. At the end of the day, if, even if it is go to Goodwill also, it's transforming, it's not no more staying in the, it's no more used properly. And uh, overall, if you see, only 15%, 14 to 15 percentage is recovered, like which is when it goes to recycling or reusing or in the different purposes. And the rest, 85% just go to landfill. It's a huge amount just end, ended over there. And only approximately only just one percentage is recycled. Uh, the rest 14 percent is reused. So that is a, one of the major reasons why we need to look into this because the consumption is keep on increasing, but the process for recycling or reusing, it's not moving. It's been stagnant like from the 2000 till 2024, it's just 15 percentage. It's not increased over the years. Yeah. Yo. So I should share also, I started this project after almost 30 years in what's referred to now as the linear um, supply chain for fashion retail. Um, so I worked for a denim manufacturer for about seven years, which supplied, among other brands, Abercrombie & Fitch. And on a lark, I came to interview in Columbus, Ohio, 21 years ago. And I spent the last 20 years um, as a senior sourcing person for Abercrombie. So um, the, I say this every time I speak, and I'll say it again right now, the system is problematic, and we need to figure out how to collaborate to evolve it. There are not bad actors. If, if anybody corners you and says they know the one entity or the one party who's at fault, and if we just obliterate that entity, all the problems will, will be solved. Stop listening, walk away, don't trust them, because the problem is complicated, yes. Yes, sorry, thank you, sorry about that. So linear meaning, um, we design something without any consideration for what will happen to it at the end of life. So it's sometimes referred to as a take, make, waste way of thinking about raw materials and the environment. Um, it's also extractive, right, in the sense that there's today majority reliance on what are called virgin materials. So yeah, cotton that was just grown, that's not recycled, or polyester that was just drilled. Um, so that's, did I answer the question? Yes. Okay. Keep asking questions. Just throw them out there. Okay, so I also was drawn to the idea of just doing something, right? This is all, this is so complicated, right? And it's so frustrating for a consumer or regular person to think, you know, is there anything I possibly can do to, you know, to solve this or make a difference? And I just decided to try. And it's very scary to try something. It's very scary to you know, do something by oneself. Um, but I find that there's a lot, of, a lot of generosity and appreciation for that idea, right? Just trying to make a difference. And so I've been thinking about what are different ways to attack this problem, right? All of the things that we wear only seven to 10 times, they're, they're here in our closets. And we have reason to believe that there's nothing wrong with lots of those things. The thing that I got especially interested in, and I'm trying to come at this problem with the mindset of a for-profit big brand, which keeps its consumer at the center of all of its decisions, at the center of every, you know, every consideration that it makes about how to do business. So this is the truth. And if you raise your hand and say that you're different from this, I'll believe you but you're not in the majority. The truth is that consumers who can afford to buy new do not say to themselves, let me get in the car and drive to a national charity store to see if they have the black pants that I need. The, cons the customer experience today is too different. It's not normative, it's just not a habit that most of us have formed yet. And it's inconvenient. Right, the chance that you're gonna find that pair of black pants when you drive to the national charity store, even though there actually are many really good ones, not even four miles from where we're standing, is pretty small. So I put myself in the, I tried to put myself in the mind of the problem-solving approach that a big brand would have. So 
Can we offer consumers convenience at a hyper-local level to scale the reuse of clothing and to keep it out of landfills? Now, for reasons that are not part of this talk, I do not think we are going to see the kind of disruptive change that is needed to really evolve the system from brands. And it's not their fault, per se, but a brand that is, that is publicly traded has a very short time horizon within which to make decisions and to deliver value to its shareholders. And all of the kinds of change that we hope to see in the future, for one thing, we need to wait for the consumer to start asking for them, but they're big. They involve totally modifying how you design product. They involve really totally modifying how you procure the raw materials for that product. And it's gonna be a while until we start to see brands shifting in a big dramatic way, because it's expensive and it's complicated, right? And the consumer is not yet shouting for it. So taking a different approach, I'm thinking to myself, okay, all of the clothing is in our closets, right? We the consumers, a lot of consumers do wanna do something. They care, people care about this problem, right? And I kept coming back to this hyper-local idea by way of a solution. So in one community, for one thing, you have the same seasonality. You probably also have the same affinity for certain brands, certain styles, certain silhouettes, right? The clothing, is the clothing that we need for the next couple of seasons is probably here, within walking distance of, of where we live, right? So, so I'm doing an experiment, right? So I really, really focused on convenience. What I didn't learn how to do is click, clicking the wrong button, there we go. Um, I just clicked this button many times, Zach, is that gonna be a problem? Did I blow up the interweb? No. Okay, so the first thing that I did was I thought about collection. And so um, I'm appreciative of the generosity of the library and the mayor and Capital University and wherever else, Temple Israel. Um, JCC for allowing me to place these publicly accessible bins throughout Bexley. And so people can drop whatever it is they're done using into a bin, and I wanna mention several of them are full now almost every day. So if my goal is shifting consumer behavior, that is an indicator that I'm shifting someone's behavior, which makes me really, really happy and, and optimistic. In addition, I collect things from this adorable bike trailer, which I happened to bring in here today. And so the idea of centralizing a lot of these activities around a bike is one of the ways that I'm hoping to engage in lots of conversations with people around me. Because one of the things that people don't like to do is criticized mercilessly for how terrible they are and how wrong they are and how they're part of the problem. People stop listening, right? There's a ter ter terribly siloed way of thinking about so many problems today, right? So the bike, and the, it's also carbon negative, but the idea of using a bicycle to do this work and to advance this project, in addition to being very public, it's a way to engage with people and have a conversation that's inclusive and kind and warm from which I'm hopeful, because I've had hundreds of them over the past year, I think people are walking away maybe with a slightly different, different thought or different intention about their own uh, future consumption. So, and by now, I just want to share, I have promised to take the names to my grave, but people show up with carloads of clothing and they say, Lisa, don't tell anybody it was me that gave you this much stuff, and they like, <laughs> put it down, and then they drive away. And it's great stuff, right? And so this is what my garage looks like every two weeks when I get ready to sort all the things that I've collected. Okay, so I had to include these pictures of me smiling because I'm extremely proud of the swaps. So clothing swaps are really hard. They're really, really hard, but they're really important. And what I, I had nine clothing swaps in a 12-month period. Some were success, some were disaster. Um, based on uh, baby and maternity 
was an absolute disaster for two reasons, I think. One, I had it in June, and I think people are just not here for community activities, so it was low engagement. But also, part of the magic of having a swap is, you know, you go from that jumbled craziness, right, to a pretty nicely assorted area. It's actually not that hard, but when someone hands you a bin, and everybody has way too much infant clothing, that's the other thing I learned, they hand you a bin and it's like, you know, this big, you're like, oh, I should be able to sort through that and merchandise it in 45 minutes. But it's so much stuff. I would almost be in tears and then no one, you know, very few people came. They all dumped their baby stuff on me and then nobody came. Um, but, but these are really important because they're fun, they're social, they're community building, right? People will come and hang out with their friends, maybe have a glass of cheap Boda Box wine, right? And if they're also engaging in a clothing swap, if they're also hopefully putting in five or 10 things that are great quality that they're just done using and picking up five or 10 things that are new, th new to them that are also terrific quality, all the better. And with these swaps, um, I've also really focused on trying not to boil the ocean in terms of what people can expect, right? Trying to create a little bit more convenience in the experience. So each of the swaps that I've had and will continue to have are either customer segment focused or product category focused. So infinite, yes, yes. They're paying a small participation fee for me to rent the venue and buy the cheap wine. But yes, it's very cheap. Right. Right. Yeah. Not at a swap. I've tried to combine swap and sale, and I just haven't figured out how to do that. It's all right. I think it's just, at the moment, I think it's too complicated. Um, but the, so I've had a formal wear swap, kids wear swap for like lower school age, uh, women's wear swap, I've had a, you know, outerwear and ski apparel swap, right? And so people know what they're getting into. And so, you know, taking my first snarky comment about looking for the black pants, well actually, if you came to the women's, uh, women's like work attire swap that I had in April of last year, and I'm having another one in May, actually probably could find several pairs of black pants if that was something that you knew you needed, right? So my hope is that we can normalize and operationalize the idea of these community clothing exchanges, and so maybe people will wait until after the swap that's next week or whatever, you know, because it's on the calendar, to go to Easton or to go to a Ritzier or to hop online to buy whatever it is that they, that they want. We just need to slow down consumption. None of this is about people not adorning themselves. None of this is about people not, you know, being allowed to feel great about how they're dressed. None of this is about people not loving clothing. I love clothing. I love clothing. We just need to think a little bit, we, there needs to be a little bit more intentionality about how we spend our money and how many things we consume. So I had these swap events and I had a 38% adoption rate average across all of these events. That means that if I collected, sorted, and set 1,000 units, 380 went home with new owners. And that's a pretty big number because with a swap where the assumption, and I can, I can attest that this is true in Bexley, with the assumption that what's there is good quality choices, I can safely assume a decent replacement rate, meaning, Jill, you went home with something from a swap and you are gonna use that thing instead of buying a new thing. And so that starts to then reduce, potentially, right, our uh, carbon emissions, water, and energy impact. Um, so a big part of this model is donation. That's a fearless team of volunteers who show up twice a month to um, help me sort. I think Jill's gonna come maybe to one of the upcoming ones. So we aggregate all, you know, so we aggregate all of the stuff that's collected, we sort it. Most of it really needs to be donated, 
most of it is good quality, but probably not something that I'm gonna you know, sell immediately inside Bexley. But I don't have data to back this up, but I have very, very strong feelings that this is true. The things that I choose to donate to an organization serving the local community, and I'll say in one second what that means, I think those are the same things that a national charity might deem ineligible for resale, so gets landfilled right away, or might sit on the selling floor for the typical 90 days and then get bailed and exported to the global south, right? And then if it's a cold weather item, probably landfilled or incinerated in that country, in that importing country. So the idea of like micro-sorting and figuring out how to aggregate quantities of things and then find out what organizations serving the local community need and even more importantly, don't need is another really important social and, environment, and environmental impact of this model, right? So Sanctuary Night is an organization which serves people who have left sex trafficking. Okay, so believe it or not, they need sports bras. I get so many sports bras. And raise your hand if the first place you go to buy your underwear is a national charity. No one's ever raised their hand. But, but I have sports bras, and when I have 50 or 100 of them, it's actually great to take them over to Sanctuary Night. That's a, that's a clear, pure landfill diversion, keep things in circulation play. And that's just one example of, of several. So I think the whole idea of being, again, much more intentional and clear and communicative with organizations that can use things to find out what is it that you need and what is it that you don't need, and then getting those, those things in the right places is another really important part of this model. And that's actually not even something that Ragul has, has analyzed in the data, but I think it's really important. So, so far, um, Sanctuary Night, Broadly Elementary, which has a high percent of families that are SNAP eligible, they have a, a closet that's governed by the faculty that's all stuff that I drop off to them. Um, Bishop Griffin, every two weeks, a volunteer comes and picks up, you know, big, big quantities, like, you know, in some cases, like a couple hundred pounds of, of clothing, but it's, but it's sorted by product category and in some cases by size range already. So it's easier for them to take and put where they need, they need it. They always need men's clothing. So the fact that they have like a bag filled of men's outerwear, men's pants, men's tops, that helps them serve their clients by getting it onto the, into their free store really quickly. Um, that's Bradley Elementary and then you know, after my formal wear swap, I took all of the appropriate dresses to Fairy Good Mothers, right? So are you gonna drive one or two to Penn Zone or to, you know, to the Fairy Good Mother warehouse? Probably not, but I had 100 or 85 or whatever. So that starts to be meaningful, right? Um, and then finally, um, resale. So I love to ride this trike around, it's like, I could talk for an hour about the trike, but um, this is a custom mobile store, basically, and all of the inventory that I am gonna sell usually fits right inside of it. And I'm at the farmer's market, right next to the farmer's market. This was at Bloom Fest. This was actually in Old Town East. And again, it's, it's, it's a fun way for people to have a conversation about what I'm doing. Yes, they might be buying a, you know, a Vince cashmere sweater for $40 from the trike, but it's also, what is this? It's a trike. You know, so, so it's resale, but it's also another great customer intercept opportunity. Um, and I think that you know, the people who can afford to buy new, they're strolling through the farmer's market and they're encountering me with my mi mi mission and my message. And that's a really important part of this thing. Yes, Craig. Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So I have a, a decent amount of awareness of the customer segmentation so far. Um, there are people who are just interested in the economic benefit of, of 
putting in the stuff that they don't need anymore and getting stuff out. They probably aren't coming to buy from me. But I'm here for them because they still were going to get their next size up stuff from somewhere, and why not have it be from within the local ecosystem? Um, definitely the people who are so committed to sustainability, like your family, right? You're, they're, they're here for kind of all of the things that I do, and I'm, I'm grateful for them too. My target customer is, I think I'm working on them, right? But it's elusive. My target customer is elusive. My target customer is the person who can afford to buy something new anytime they want. Because the top 20% of consumers in any um, developed country are the most, you know, they are the most prolific consumers in discard, sorry, excuse me, the top 20% of wealth holders in any developed country are the most prolific consumers and discarders of fashion, right? So those are the people, if, if my mission is an environmental mission, right, I love, I love the social impact, but if my mission is, is an environmental mission, I need to get those people to do something different, to consume a little bit less and to be open to the idea of being part of a circular economy, which means being open potentially to pre-owned things flowing through their own community. That, those, are, those are the ones. There are people who purchase from me because it is just great value, right? You know, pre-owned clothing is much less expensive than, than new clothing. And because Bexley, right, which is, you know, I'm interested next in finding the other communities that check these boxes, right? Bexley's population density, its size, and its house, at average household income, which is I think 144,000, where the national average is 62,000, it makes it a really, um, it makes it very predictable and reliable that what I have is really good quality. So people are interested, that's the other part, is people are interested in, in buying from me. Uh, that's a great question. For sure, women are marketed to six, more successfully than men. Women consume way more clothing than men do. Um, I, have, I actually have a lot of customers from the capital community who are male. So I, I want to say I think younger, among Gen Z, I think men are more interested in this idea than in, in older generations. But yeah, generally it's women, people who identify as women. Are there any other questions before Ragul says some things? This, by the way, is the poster that we presented at the International Textile and Apparel Conference in Baltimore during our road trip. So, yeah, the Gen Z is the biggest generation who purchases more of thrifting. They like thrifting other than buying because they use for three to four times, then they just give back to store, and then again they purchase. So they love the thrifting more than any other generation in the pre previous history. So looking into our study, uh, I was, I was analyzing the life cycle assessment methodology to analyze the environmental impact done by Lisa's Circular Thrift, the innovative startup. And uh, so I don't want to, like, as we spoke already on the part of introduction, I would say, like, looking into the existing barriers into this area, like the clothing sector and textile sector, there, are, there is no a formal resource collection and recovery systems. It relies most of the time based on the charitable organizations like Goodwill most of the time and rest it goes to, even if it goes to charitable trust, once a charitable trust is not able to sell, it just go to second countries. Most of the time it ends in African countries. And the opportunities looking into the textile recycling, it's not a good uh, area which is like well developed still in the market, it is still developing space. And most of the industries, the manufacturing industries are not helping that industry to grow because end of the day, it's all about consumption, new consumption. So that's So just let me interrupt for one second. So when we talk about recycling, just wild guess, what percent of textiles are actually recycled today? Anybody else? What? Yes, it's less one, than one. It's one, one percentage, exactly one percentage throughout the globe. And particularly in the US, it is one percentage. Because if 
the country, US is one of the established, well-developed country, said to be the first tier country. If the recycling phase is low here, then it's not going to be anywhere more than one percentage throughout the EU, throughout the world. So that is one of the big thing has to be developed throughout. And uh, looking into this value extending of apparel, every apparel can be used for at least for seven to 10 years, depends upon the product. But for example, if it is underwear, it's, it stands for five to seven years for, for sure for a wash. Even if it is in the regular wash, it can withstand for five to seven years. Most of the outerwears can survive for 10 years. But it is people are, the conception is more, people are not using more than seven to 10 times. So it ends in landfill. So looking into the lasers model, it reduces the negative impacts on the environment and it, uh, new garments purchase. That is one of the best thing I would say. So in our method we used, like in my study, I used the cradle to cradle where Lisa circulates most of the prematurely discarded apparel through pickup donations of his or drop off or pop off thrift events and swap events. So I'll di jump directly to the measurements. We, I measured through the impact per product category. So we calculated a top as or different category, bottom and then uh, accessories and... Raghul was very mean by the way. Twice during this study, he insisted, because this is part of the study, that we do a very, very, very extensive data collection of a sampling of whatever we were sorting. And it was like 95 degrees, and he made us get all this data. He, did, he was there with us the whole time, which was wonderful. And then we were able to, he was able to apply that data to the larger quantity, but it was very, very exacting and very, very intense. Like we would, we gathered what, like 10 pieces of information about every single item that we touched during those two deep dive data collection moments. Yeah. It was very hard. So in the LCM, in the life cycle measurements, first I calculated product per category, then total landfill diversions, like in weights and pounds we calculated, then impact of replacement and displacement rate. So our assumption is if the, uh, the all the items collected by circular thrift would go to landfill if it is if it is not collected. So if we calculate that as a landfill diversion rate and the second hand garments replaces a new garment. So that is a replacement rate and reusing a product offset environment, like we did, uh, offset the environmental impact of producing a new product. So that is a displacement rate. So and well, so we taken the, I taken the data from November 22 to October 23. I don't know the weather graph, you can see from the graph from there. So totally we sorted 10,976 products in a year, like in nine months period. And the direct sales was 500, somewhere around 500, and swap was 1,200, and uh, which was given to local communities was somewhere around 1,000, and given to thrift, sorry, uh, yeah, Goodwill thrift stores were 1,700. And the products still in the inventory were somewhere around 3,900, and only 300 products are end up in land, uh, end up in garbage because it was not in the state of reusing. And we are still finding the method where can we use that, like where can we, we have a way the possible of reusing or recycling through the products. So uh, through our product replacement rate, it is 100 percentage product replaced. Uh, we replaced 4,908 products. And most of the, if you look into the product category, the highest number is tops, either women tops or men's tops. It's tops category has the highest, includes t-shirts, uh, shirts, and women's tops, everything. And the second followed by uh, dresses, outerwear, and bottoms, and the other accessories. All the rest was almost 20, 20 percentage, I would say. And then looking at the water consumption, if the product end in landfill or if the new product might have manufactured, it might have consumed more water. Uh, so using circular thrift model, it consumed, it saved uh, around 75% uh, of water, water which is used for manufacturing. And then environmental impact, looking into the energy saving, it served, saved around 8,000, sorry, 84,000 energies 
And looking into the total impact of the study, the model which circular, uh, which circular thrift use is a best hyperlocal method, which can, which is if, if it is taken to a different community, it can save much resources than manufacturing a new garment. And now, if I look into the method limitations, uh, second items directly replace new items for at least 15 years, reduces the production and distribution impact, like the uh, practical, looking, looking at the practical consideration, I would say, real world may not fully substitute second hand for new, that is the one thing. Not every co consumer will be ready to take it forward. And uh, the transportation impact is one of the thing, like transporting from one area to the other consumes little energy. That is a one of the th other thing. But Lisa uses cycles, so it saves that too. Yeah. Weather permitting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's. So this really is <clears throat> this is system change, right? And what I'm. Oops. Um, so <clears throat> when I look at what I have aggregated over probably another two months since the data was, was collected and summarized for this conference, so about 13,000 units were sorted in my garage. Don't ask my family where their belongings are anymore. The garage is a sort facility. Um, and if, if I take into consideration what was swapped, donated, and sold, 43% um, of all of those units that came through this process remained in some greater degree of circulation than if we didn't, didn't try this. And so, you know, that's an update of the environmental impact based on this, you know, higher volume of what's sorted. And one can make a legitimate claim that this model is associated with these four of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, and life on land, all by, at scale, resulting in reduced consumption and reduced landfiller incineration of fashion. So, what I'm really interested in is obviously Bexley's 14,000 people, 13,000 units is not that many units, but um, I believe that this is a repeatable model. So my, my Grammy moment, if we are all allowed to imagine those, is that there are you know, 500 communities in the US with some equally crazy, maybe 20 years younger version of Lisa Goldsand leading their community and you know, and doing this work. I think, it's, I think it's possible. I think it's possible for a couple of reasons. One, the data shows that it's possible, but also the, um, the amount of interest in the crazy things that I'm doing just from regular people says to me that humans want to be a part of a solution in this, in this specific area. And so I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. I never want for volunteers, I never want for thought partners, um, so I'm gonna keep going. So that's what this is about. So Bexley's where it all started. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? We did have one come through online. Is it uh, from my mom? No. Oh. <laughs> Someone <laughs> asked, uh, what is uh, the best way to get involved with you and what are your biggest volunteer needs for circular thrift? Is this person in Bexley? So I can always use help sorting. I can always use help, especially if I travel, um, emptying the bins throughout, the, throughout our town. Um, I try very hard to keep them tidy and empty as often as possible. Um, I, I do wanna make a, a PSA. I am ready to hire, um, we're talking like $30 and some free clothes, maybe a teenager, maybe a college student, maybe a person who just is social and wants to get out there to learn how to ride the trike and to preside over some 
pop-up sales over the spring and summer. For the right, like I live my best life when I'm out there with the trike. I just, I can't do it as many, as often as I would like to during the week and it's a little spontaneous, right? Because when I try to plan them in advance, invariably there's a blizzard. Invariably, there's a, I had a pop-up event in six degrees. I had scheduled it, I had posted about it, so I still did it. Um, but I really am looking for somebody who's just fun and wants to make a little extra money. If it's nice weather, they come, they take the trike, and they take it someplace where I have permission to sell on Main Street. Those are my needs. Craig? So, oh yeah. For the thousands of people on the live yes. stream, please. Um, so one of the things that I find fun about going to thrift stores is just the hunt and seeing unique things. Yeah. Do you have any examples of anything unique, weird, surprising that was donated to you? Oh, I love that question. Yes, I do. But I want to say something about the hunt. <clears throat> it's, I agree that it's fun to find something really valuable in a thrift store. But one could make the case that the system, the system that makes one have to look at, like, a, you know, for a needle in a haystack, for a fun thing or valuable thing from, you know, what everybody, you know, you go to the national charity, you throw everything in the Gaylord and then somebody sorts it out, right? It's terribly inefficient and I could make the case that it's not sustainable. And here's what I mean by that. The most sustainable thing is for us to valorize our clothing. So to get the optimal, the most value out of it through resale initially, right? So the Patagonia better sweater vest, let's say, that somebody might have found at the Goodwill, it's better that that item was posted online on wherever, Depop, eBay, Poshmark, right? And that somebody who was looking for that thing got it at a great price. Maybe not for $7, right? But maybe it was $20 where it's 120 new, right? The reason I'm an advocate of that type of process is that that's more likely to result in the replacement of the production of something new. Okay, so now I'm gonna answer your, your, the more fun part of your question. So every two weeks, there's something crazy. There was a, a boot jack this last time, and um, there were, uh, you know those things that you put on your, um, underneath your shoes when it's like icy? Okay, it was just the sole parts, not the band parts. So what I do is, I post it on Facebook. Whoever doesn't know what I do, they must think like I'm completely crazy. And then I send to one of my friends who helps me to sort, I send her all of the screen grabs of all of the people who it appears the day cannot end without them having this thing that's like missing the straps. Like it's fascinating to see how people descend on this thing. I had a salt lamp, a salt lamp. I got like 20 inquiries about the salt lamp. I mean, so a boot jack, salt lamp. I had an interesting combination of a rosary, um, a, a pride flag, and a bunch of condoms all in a Ziploc bag this past week. <laughs> so, but I have to say something. Like, I do love people. I do, like, I'm very grateful to be alive every day. And I do, um, there's something really kind of magical about like the anthropological aspect of what am I gonna find here today? It's like, I'm kind of here for it. Yeah. <laughs> Rarely. Yes, but I mean a tiny, tiny percent. Usually it's clean, decent quality clothing. I mean, I throw away very, very little. But I do throw away something, like, like Ruggle shared in the study. I throw away something if I think it's bad. I don't, oh, so what I do give to the Goodwill, and I, I meet for coffee every quarter or so with Ryan Burgess, who's the CEO of Goodwill Columbus and lives in Bexley. Um, what I end up giving to the Goodwill is not stuff that's poor quality, but stuff that I think is a little bit too hoochy to give to Bishop Griffin. Honestly, you know, if it's just really fashion forward, I just don't, and I don't think that they'll appreciate, um, you know, having it in their in their flow. Then that's that's pretty much what I give to the goodwill. So if you're looking for extra hoochie stuff, there's probably a high concentration coming from Circular Thrift to the Whitehall Goodwill. 
Well, you do for the thousands of I listeners on YouTube. I've been accused of being quiet, but um, <laughs> so I have spent many years reducing my wardrobe in general and making all those donations, like Dress for Success and... Yeah. Um, my question is, so I've gotten my wardrobe down to 130 pieces, and you. I am interested in the swap, but I wear everything that I own. So if I have nothing to bring to the swap, but I might be looking for something, what, what would you do in that instance? Okay, first of all, I would say, see me later, because I want you to come to the swap and we'll make it work out. There's also such an abundance of stuff that one person who has a capsule. What I wear, yeah. What I So first of all, that's absolutely amazing. That's amazing. Let's all. <laughs> I'm not the best person, but, you know, no, I'm sure you are, but yeah. You are such an anomaly that I would say you're welcome to the swap every time and there's plenty of stuff there. So yeah, no, really, um, that's just not a problem that most people face is the, is the reality. Oh, just. Write to me and just say you're coming. Yeah, for sure, you should come. Because there's, there's, there's always a ton of great stuff left over. Yes? Thanks. Are there any consignment shops that take vintage clothing anymore? Because it seems like <clears throat> any of the shops that we take things to, the clothing has to be younger than two years old. And if it's younger than two years old, we're not ready to, to get rid of it. Um, that's a great question. Um, does Second Chance take vintage? They don't anymore. Well, I would say don't get rid of your vintage stuff because for sure there are people who would sell it for you. It's probably online, but it's people want it. So I don't know, I do not know of a, I didn't know that people were turning away vintage clothing in the, in the consignment world. Um, I can do a little bit of research and get back to you. I don't, I don't have an answer other than maybe eBay or Depop. Do you know what Depop is? Yeah, I've never asked someone over 25 if they know what Depop is and heard them say anything other than no, what is that? Depop is a peer-to-peer, -peer, you know what Depop is, don't you? Do you know? You don't? Oh, I'm surprised by that. So it's a, it's a peer-to-peer clothing resale um, app and it's really, it's really good, D-E-P-O-P. -E um, eBay, I think, also has a, has a lot of vintage. There are people who make a lot of money selling vintage on eBay. Another question came through online. Is um, this from my mom? I, I don't know, I, oh. this is an anonymous chat. Um, someone asked, uh, what, do you have any tips to share for other people who might want to start these in other communities? You said your vision was to see these pop up in, in other communities. So do you have any tips for people who might want to start? I have this more model? than a tip. I have more than a tip. I'm I am going to have a documented roadmap for how someone could do this in another neighborhood within this season. So I will be ready to provide very, very specific support and instruction. I've learned, I've learned a lot of things the hard way in the past year and a half, right? Um, so there will be like a formal co-op partnership opportunity for, um, for anybody who's interested in, in leading this in their community. Upper Arlington will be the, the first next um, co-op partner. Yes. Can you talk about um, circular thrift compared to a thrift store? Like running circular thrift compared to having a retail space? Oh. Uh, Do you have any comments about that? Yes. So thrift stores are, are terrific, of course. The, the brick and mortar of a thrift store um, appeals to me and I don't know if I need it. I mean, my, I have a, what's essentially a virtual thrift store that's available to all of Bexley. My vision is that I'm delivering by bicycle, right? I, I have yet to receive a local order, but I'm gonna be super excited and I'm gonna make a big reel when it, when it happens. Um, <clears throat> as far as the model goes though, uh, the idea of this slightly more complicated localized ecosystem 
of circulation is probably more, more, has a larger environmental impact than just using a thrift store. But thrift stores are a part of the whole, the whole circle for sure. Did I answer your question? Were you asking why I don't have a brick and mortar or the difference of, got it. Thank you for that. And thank you for that. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. That's so encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for following me. I appreciate it. Well, Lisa and Rug, well, thank you so much for coming and sharing this information with us. It's very important, and it's wonderful that it's right here in Bexley. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.